So in the final chapter, he, uh, he takes issue with the idea of man's conquest of nature. Because of course, in the early 20th century, this was a phrase that was bandied about a lot. And in their defense, you can see why. Going back to Francis Bacon, who really kind of originated the concept, things sucked in the 1600s. Hmm. Things really sucked. Like, it's hard to imagine a world where you have to go into surgery and you don't have anesthetic or any kind of painkiller hmm. at all. It's hard to imagine. And every historical, uh, like Victorian surgeries, my wife loves to go and see these Victorian surgeries. And so we went, went, went to one in London. It was a Victorian hospital in London. And it's, you know, historic site now. And so the, the, there's a guy taking us around telling us about the surgeries, just how awful they were. And I'm just like, God, thank God. Thank God I live in the modern era, right? So it's not that there wasn't a lot to conquer, right? There's a good reason. There's a, there's a huge amount of human suffering that actually could be reasonably alleviated by science against what seems to be kind of a cruel natural order, if you think about it. And so I can see the motivation. That I look. It's just, we, you know, we a lot of them would have been like, look, we don't want to overthrow the universe or man's place in it. We just could do with a little less pain. You know, think, think about when you've got a toothache. Imagine you, did, imagine you had to get, go to the dentist without any bloody anaesthetic. It's quite funny that you brought up the idea of taking the soul disembodied out of the body and no longer having any want, because the abolition of want seems to be the driving factor for the transformation of nature now, yep. because we've moved past the point, I think 30 years ago, where you could say that, at least in the West, absolute privation was a problem. Yep. And we have... Diseases. Our problem now is obesity. Yeah, exactly. Our, our, our poor people are fat. We have diseases, we have social ails, and then the third world still need to catch up, more so back then. But we have now less of a problem of fighting nature and more of uh, an expansion of our sense of guilt as to being on the planet and saying we are at odds with it. So what we want now is to maximise consumption without any of the guilt or constraint of resource consumption. So that's why you're mm. getting renewably powered experience pods. This is why you're getting the metaverse. Mm. This is why you're getting the direct stimulation of certain brain areas by neural <laughs> implant chips rather than using hard drugs, for example. So that's where it's apexed, I think. And it's going to cause We're fighting a lot of against our own success. Yes. And we we are, the, but however, we're addicted to the fruits of the success. I don't want to give up any of the things that it, this industrial society gave us mm. but also i recognize the industrial society is not in and of itself an inherent good mm. uh, which is the most charitable way of putting these anti-human freaks uh but yeah it's an interesting contradiction again they're, they're trapped in but anyway what what this was uh, framed as in his time was uh, man's power over nature and he says that actually if you think about it it's really uh, the power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Mm. And that's what science is, really. Uh, and so this raises the specter of human engineering. It does. And we're staring right into the barrel of that gun right mm -hmm. now. Doesn't look good. Uh, the, the, the question that the power of human engineering raises is the power of the present generation hold that it holds over successive generations as in what will we in the present turn the men of the future into and that's a weighty question like that's a serious obligation i mean on one hand i can see there's a strong argument i think saying well look genetic diseases could possibly be eradicated mm -hmm. because of course they're flaws in the tower or the, you know, because of the way that the world is imperfect and so I think the men of the future will say, well, thank you for making sure I don't have this genetic anomaly mm. that means I can't, you know, walk or whatever it is. That seems noble. And it seems that the people of the future will say, thank you. But if we're trapped in an ideology that says, well, the men of the future won't need testosterone to be men. What was that line about castration he used earlier? Yeah, we're going to turn them into geldings and bid them be fruitful. Mm. Yeah. So... The amount of genetic power that we start wielding has massive consequences in the future. Uh, and he's got a good way of framing this, actually. He says, each generation exercises power of its, over its successors, and each, insofar as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition, resists and limits the powers of its predecessors. Uh, and so that's so what we do now has a a, a strong, firm grasp over the future. And what we re reject from the past is 
holding back the power of those who came before us. And so this modifies the picture in which sometimes, which is sometimes painted of a progressive emancipation from tradition and progressive control of natural processes, resulting in a continual increase of human power. And so that's the traditional view of things. But in fact, it's ex the exact reverse. Uh, the people who live after us will be living under our power in what we did to them because of our ability to engineer what a man is. Whereas where your grandparents couldn't engineer what a man was, but they could help you, your father, and help you to become a man, uh, well, that's not going to be something that the future generations can do or, or reject even. you know, Because, okay, you could reject a tradition, you could train yourself in a different way, and at least you are still the same basic human substance that has options. But if in the future we say, right, every, every man is going to have you know, a third of the muscle mass or something like that, good luck. Yeah, that constitutes a near permanent physical deviation from the Tao. Whereas teaching the schoolboy the wrong thing could be corrected by himself or within a generation. Exactly. That means that you have disadvantaged successive generations to such a degree that they are unrecognizable as human because they've strayed so far from the Tao. All humans from that point onwards stop being human in a way. Yep. Uh, and so this uh, this goes on, this process goes on until the, the men at the end of the chain have almost no power at all. He says... The last men, being far from being the heirs of power, because we, we assume that all of this scientific advancement will just make them more powerful in the future, but actually uh, they will be the men of all men most subject to the dead hand of the great planners and conditioners and will themselves exercise the least power upon the future. As in, they will have been engineered. And so, what, you know, what what is an engineering? If you, if you get the, 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 the lump of oak and you start cutting away parts of it. Well, those bits are gone forever. You know, you might create a lovely shape, but you've always lost material. Whereas before, when it was in the Tao, it had the maximum amount of material that it could have. Mm, this reminds me of the argument the, the world controller gives to John the Savage at the end of Brave New World, oh, yeah, where he says that we've had so many successive generations of genetic planning and cultural brainwashing that even if you tried to reintroduce Shakespeare to them, they would never have the appropriate context with which to understand it. Just like if you did that to a man, yeah. you deprived him genetically and culturally of a chest for so many generations and then brought him to a waterfall, he wouldn't be able to describe the feeling of sublime anymore. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. And so, and that, that and I, th I think the metaphor of the, the, the carving of the tree actually is quite a good one because this is just material that will never be replaced. Mm. It's gone forever. It can't regenerate without its roots. Yes. And instead of liberating and increasing man's power, each new power won by man is a power over man as well, further restricting him. And so this looks, okay, well, fine. Uh, the, okay, fair enough. Maybe you're in favor of all of this for whatever reason. Maybe you're a leftist who is deeply resentful against your father and uh, the world around you. Um, so the, the battle against nature has been won. But who has won this battle, actually? Because if man has power to make himself as he pleases, uh, what will the people who are the conditioners be doing this in aid of? If they think they've stepped outside of the Tao, well, in what way are they conditioning you? You know, so you've got the, the, the conditioners who begin the process and presumably who carry it on. Uh, they can cut posterity into whatever shape they please, he says. Uh, if they're outside of the Tao creating the new Tao, why should they choose to create man in a certain way instead of a different way? And why should the men of the future be happy that they've been crafted in this way? Uh, and so it turns out that, again, even if the conditioners are to choose a kind of artificial Tao, it's really about their own whims that are motivating them. Mm. And so it's like, well, I just feel this would be better. It's like, okay, but we get back to the previous essay. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? You go through your debunking logic, and eventually it gets back to instinct, well, that's the product of the Tao, again. Unless you make a conscious decision to invert all the values of the Tao having recognised it, and that is something akin to a death drive, which will discontinue the human race, and then on a long enough timeline, nature wins anyway. That's precisely Lewis's argument. But I mean, like, imagine if you did create an inversion of the Tao, or an inversion mm. of the traditional morality. You'd essentially be willingly creating hell. Yes. Like, that's that would be actually the goal and we wonder why so many of the progressive values align with the chaos demons and also look at their communities like unwholesome is the only way i can describe them yeah um, portland wouldn't be akin to heaven yeah uh so anyway the these these 
controllers, these future men, uh, would not be men in the old sense at all, he says. Uh, they would be outside of humanity and sculpted as if they were gods. Stepping outside the tower, they have stepped into the void. Nor are their subjects, they're not necessarily bad men, nor are their subjects unhappy men. They are not men at all. They are artifacts. Man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man. But, as we just said, the conditioners actually started before the conditioning, and so they themselves must be using a system of values. Uh, and so, eventually, he says, man's conquest of nature turns out, in the moment of its consummation, to be nature's conquest of man. So, and I, I love the framing. Every victory we win, or seem to win, has led us step by step to this conclusion. All nature's apparent reverses have been but tactical withdrawals. We thought we were beating her back when she was luring us on. Because then, eventually, man is trapped himself into the natural impulses of the original conditioners in a way that neuters man and keeps him contained and small and presumably to eventually slowly die off until we reach something that we can consider to be the last man. Because really, if we, if you think about like nature living within the Tao, there will be what, there, there will never be what we can really call a last man. There'll be an evolution into a different species and then an evolution into different species. And that's the way that evolution works, assuming there's no great catastrophe, like the dinosaurs or something. Um, but with this, actually, what we're doing is kind of engineering the inevitable end of man, where we can literally point at the last generation and say they will be the last. Mm. Not good. No. <laughs> um, and he, Again, he's, uh, he's got a beautiful way of putting it. Nature will no longer be uh, vexed no longer by man's chatter of truth and mercy and beauty and happiness. None of these things will matter. They'll all be gone. Uh, he also thinks the conditioners will hate the conditioned, but I don't think it'll be hate as much as it'll be contempt, right? Like, like I, I don't, like, it'll be a lack of respect, but not necessarily hate. I mean, I don't, I don't hate my pets, but I don't, you know, I don't think of them as being autonomous or, you know, intelligent or anything like that you know, like my cats my cats and i do love them but i'm not gonna give them privileges or you know take their word for it or you know give them the respect you'd expect of a peer well also the the servile class will have the same sort of impotence to carry out any contempt they have for knowing what they do not know or was deprived from them hmm. as Bernard Marx and Brave New World, where yeah. he wants to experience the sublime of the ocean, but all of his peers bully him out of it. Mm. And so he knows he's drugging himself to deprive himself of an experience which his forefathers would have enjoyed and would have given them a chest, but he does it so that it makes existence bearable anyways. And when it comes to telling the world controls exactly what he thinks of them, he just gets reduced to a blubbering mess with the prospect of being exiled. Yeah. When that's he, what he proclaimed to want all along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that scene where he takes, uh, what's his girlfriend's name? I can't remember the girlfriend's name, but he takes her down to the ocean and mm. she's freaking out. And he's just like, look, I just want to look at it. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, the, she doesn't understand. Um, anyway, so uh, he, he points out that the, the problem, one of the problems is that this is all a big artificial construction above what we call mere nature. Uh, and we use the term nature and natural to reduce things to the level that it becomes acceptable to conquer them. Uh, we are, he says, we are always conquering nature because nature is the name for the thing that we have to some extent conquered. The price of conquest is to treat the thing as mere nature. And so if we reduce our own species to mere nature to be conquered, uh, then, well, we're in trouble. As he says, if man chooses to treat himself as raw material, then raw material he will be. Not raw material to be manipulated as he fondly imagined by himself, but by the mere appetite, that is, the mere nature in the person of his dehumanized conditioners. So it'll be their whims. You'll be at their whims forever, and you won't even know that it's wrong. You won't know what you've lost. You'll never get it back. How could it be good? And so we are presented with the rational choice. Either we are the rational spirit, obliged forever to obey the absolute values of the Tao, or else we are mere nature to be needed and cut into new shapes for the pleasures of masters who must, by hypothesis, have no motive but their own natural impulses. And therefore, a dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.